in the last few videos, I had described this basic notion of a memory hierarchy or a cache hierarchy, and we had seen how the storage elements grow in size as you move away from the CPU. In this next set of videos, I'm going to describe how an individual cache is managed. That is, how do I figure out what data to bring, where it gets placed, and if that data is already present in the cache when I'm doing future lookups. So to explain this concept, I'm going to first move away from this notion of processors and, and caches. Instead, I'm going to act as if I'm teaching a software engineering class, and I'm going to explain how I might design an internet browser cache. And it's helpful to kind of look at this analogy because it's much easier to deal with, with internet URLs than it is to deal with 32-bit strings of zeros and ones, which is what an address access would be uh, to my memory system. Okay, so let's move away from the processor and the cache. Let's just look at this other analogous example. So let's say that I'm building a cache for my internet browser. And how would I go about doing that, right? So the first thing I would do is I would define a cache that had 26 entries. And I'll soon explain why that particular number of 26. So there are all these entries in my internet browser cache. And I'm going to assume that when I access a certain website, I'm going to go out and bring that entire website and place it into my cache. The expectation is that you know I've accessed the first page in that website. In the near future, I'm going to access all the other pages on that website as well, right? So I'm making a few assumptions over here, but this kind of helps me construct a good example. So let's say that I go to cnn.com slash politics. So when I make this access, I first look up my cache. There is no cnn.com web page in my cache, so that's a cache miss. Then I go out to the cnn.com servers, and I bring that entire website and place it into my cache. Because this website starts with the letter C, I'm going to place it in my third entry over here, right? So that's the reason I had 26 entries in my cache. I'm willing to store one website for each starting letter. Okay, so the cnn.com website will get placed here. And this cache entry is going to contain all the pages that belong to cnn.com. And just to make the example simpler, I'm going to assume that the cnn.com website is organized in this way, where it is cnn.com slash story one dot html slash story two dot html and so on right so it's not really organized as politics entertainment sports and so on it's basically organized by story one story two story three and so on so when i bring in the entire cnn website it gets placed here and so story one is sitting here story two story three and so on until let's say story 64. so again i'm making an assumption that every website is made up of exactly 64 web pages okay so again you know just bear with me humor me as i construct this hypothetical example so now that i've done that in the future when i access cnn.com slash story 33 i'm supposed to look at this cache figure out that cnn.com is already here and then i'm supposed to retrieve story 33 from the cache and return it back to the user right and that's much faster then going all the way over the network and accessing the cnn.com servers, right? So that's the whole point of having a cache. So now how do I figure out that this particular website is already in my cache? The way I do it is by having a separate tag structure. So this structure that I'd already defined is my data array, which says that the actual data that I want to return back to the user is being stored in this structure here. And then there's a separate corresponding structure called the tag array which says that for every entry in my data array, I'm also going to have an entry here that explains to me what is sitting over there, right? So the third entry over here is going to tell me that this is cnn.com. And you'll see here that, that putting a C over here is kind of redundant because it is a third entry. That means it's bound to start with a C. So there's no reason for me to put that first letter C in this tag array storage. And so I can save a little bit of space by eliminating that first letter. So when I make an access to cnn.com slash story 33, the first thing I do is I say, let's it's a letter C, so let's check the third entry of my cache. I'm going to examine the tag here. And if the tag happens to match the early part of the address that I'm trying to access, then I say that this is a cache hit. And then I go into the cache and say, I'm looking for story 33. So let's take the 33rd piece over here and then return it back to the user. So that's how a cache lookup would work. Now let's say that I'm going to a different website. So let's say that sometime later, I decide to go to you know carmax.org slash something. And when I look up my cache, I say, let's go to the third entry. 
since it's the letter C, I'm going to check the third entry. I'm going to compare nn.com to rmax.org. They obviously don't match, so this is a cache miss. So now I'm going to go out to the CarMax website. I'm going to bring the entire CarMax website in here. And where does it get placed? It gets placed in the third entry, which is currently occupied by the CNN.com website. In this example, in this organization, I can only accommodate one website with each starting letter. So essentially, the whole CNN.com website has to be evicted to make room for this new website that I'm now accessing, right? So CNN.com gets evicted and the entire CarMax website gets placed into that third entry. And I will update my tag to say that what is sitting here is now rmax.org, right? Again, I took out that initial C because it is redundant in this case. So this is how the cache is organized. This is how it's managed. And let me just kind of recap how I'm interpreting every single address that I'm accessing, right? So this is a typical request that is being made to my internet browser cache. And I'm looking at this letter here to figure out which entry in the cache I need to access. So that's referred to as my index. That tells me where in the cache I should be looking it up. These next few bits are what I need to perform my tag comparison to figure out if the entry sitting in the cache is indeed belonging to me or it belongs to somebody else. And then finally, this last piece over here is referred to as the offset. Once I've found the entry, that last piece over there tells me exactly which subset of the cache entry is the one that I care about. And you'll see that this cache, like I had explained before, has the spatial locality effect, where if I've accessed one story in CNN.com, it increases the likelihood that other stories will already be found in cache when I do eventually get to them, right? So you're, you're prefetching a whole bunch of neighboring stories when you access one story, and even modern processor caches have that same effect to them, right? So now that I've explained this analogy, it's going to be much easier to understand how an actual processor cache access also works, right? So now I'll, I'll now move on to that.